Climate catastrophe headlines. If it bleeds, it leads. But is it true? Adventures in Climate Change Reporting. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. And we had a request on a video that we recently did about uh, one of the points that Clintel had made in their presentation. And Clintel had said that extreme weather events are not getting worse. Natural disasters are not getting worse. So we'd done like kind of a short little montage of some published findings. And we had a number of people request that we do either a slower version or a longer version so that they could actually look at the material. So I'm just going to walk through the same presentation but I've added in some of the abstracts and I'll just read two or three key points from them and then you'll be able to go to the PowerPoint which I'll post later on our blog and you can look at the links yourself. So let's have a look at climate catastrophe headlines and see if that's really what scientists are saying. So these are the headlines that we see Today's IPCC Working Group 1 report is a code red for humanity. Just a reminder, in that report, <clears throat> the word crisis appears once, and it's related to media coverage. <laughs> so in that Working Group 1 report of the IPCC, they really don't talk about a climate crisis at all. And the Working Group 1 is the physical sciences group of um, observers in the IPCC. That's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN climate body. So we don't know why uh, Antonio Guterres is saying this code red for humanity when that's not in the report. And of course then all the media pick up things like, soon the world will be unrecognizable. Is it still possible to prevent total climate meltdown? Climate, UN climate change report sounds code red for humanity. You know, none of these media people have ever read the full report. So, in the midst of all that scary stuff and all those headlines, what if you saw this? 1,200 scientists and professionals declare there's no climate emergency. Wouldn't that be something that you'd like to have a look at? And here's Clintel. This is the group of 1,200 signatory scientists and professionals who say that there's no climate emergency. Well, shouldn't we know more about that? And here's their World Climate Declaration. This is what all the scientists are signing. These are the fundamental principles of the World Climate Declaration. So natural as well as anthropogenic factors cause warming. Warming is far slower than predicted. Climate policy relies on inadequate models. Models refers to computer simulations that are representations of the Earth, but they're not actual copies of the Earth and carbon dioxide. CO2 is a plant food. It's the basis of all life on Earth. Global warming has not increased natural disasters. So this is the point we're going to be looking at in this presentation. And climate policy must respect scientific and economic realities. And since there's no climate emergency, there's no cause for panic or alarm. And that means there's no need for net zero targets. So wouldn't you want to know more about this? Global warming has not increased natural disasters. And Clintel goes on to say there's no statistical evidence that global warming is intensifying hurricanes, floods, droughts, or such like natural disasters, or making them more frequent. Well, that's almost entirely opposite to what we hear and see in headlines every day. So if facts matter to journalists, why aren't they telling you this? There's no increase in hurricane frequency. So here's a graph showing that there is no increase. This is from uh, Ryan Maui's site. He's a U.S. Uh, meteorologist and weather 
uh, scientist, climate scientist. So hurricanes and climate change, this is from his post. Around the globe, 80 to 100 tropical storms are observed every year, unevenly distributed across the Indian Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. About half go on to reach hurricane strength and a smaller percentage, about a quarter, become major hurricanes. So, in summary, it's premature to conclude with high confidence that increasing atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations from human activities have had a detectable impact on Atlantic Basin hurricane activity. And the only proven and practical way to prevent loss of life and property damage is to prepare ahead with improved building codes and maintain a high level of vigilance and resilience in the face of natural disasters. And this includes more accurate intensity and track forecasting through advanced numerical weather prediction or weather models. And it is true that many of the disastrous consequences of big weather events, extreme weather events of the past, um, the impact has been significantly reduced in the past few decades because of improved forecasting. So, uh, you know, that's a worthy investment and uh, something that we should continue to look into as well as building resiliency. You know, people used to just build literally houses out of straw and, <laughs> you know, like in the fairy tale. And uh, now buildings are, are much stronger, they're much more resilient, and generally building codes are designed for the typical extreme weather events of the region. So that's an area that can be incrementally improved over time as well. Now let's see the next slide we have here. So there's been a reduction in strong to violent tornadoes as well. And you can see this on this graph. The trend line is down. And this, the source of this graph is from NOAA data. Unfortunately, there's not just a single page you can go to to look at. All this data has to be downloaded and correlated into graphs, and it's quite a complicated process. But you can see that there's a 57.5% decline from 1955 to 2019. So that's very significant. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you know, there wouldn't or couldn't be another extreme event as we see. There have been times when there have been uh, violent tornadoes, but it does show that they're not increasing according to what headlines normally say. And there's also a reduction in global drought. So this um, paper looks at global integrated drought monitoring and prediction system. So they're saying that drought is by far the most costly natural disaster that can lead to widespread impacts, including water and food crises. Now, they're using a special method called the Global Integrated Drought Monitoring and Prediction System, um, and it uses multiple indicators in their study. And they describe it here. The system provides meteorological and agricultural drought information based on multiple satellite and model-based precipitation and soil moisture data sets. So what they're saying is that it's a very comprehensive analysis. And the results of their study indicate that uh, this data from their system, these data sets reliably captured several major droughts from across the globe. And as we saw in this graph, there's no increase. In fact, there's a reduction in global drought. <clears throat> and other good news, a significant drop in global death and death rates due to extreme weather events, declining from 242 per million in the 1920s to 3 per million in the 2000s. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's excellent news. And you can see that quite clearly here on the graph. That's a very, very significant drop. So let's go and look at this study here. We'll just look at the abstract. I'll read a few points. So deaths and death rates from extreme weather events 
from 1900 to 2008. And the author opens with this line, which reflects what the media does. Proponents of drastic greenhouse gas controls claim that human greenhouse gas emissions cause global warming, which then exacerbates the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, including extreme heat, droughts, floods, and storms such as hurricanes and cyclones. In fact, even though reporting of such events is more complete than in the past, morbidity and mortality, that's deaths of course, attributed to them, has declined globally by 93% to 98% since the 1920s. So we go on here in the yellow highlighted. Uh, depending on the category of extreme weather event, and this is in the U.S., the average annual mortality is 59% to 81% lower than at its peak, while mortality rates declined 72% to 94%, despite large increases in the population at risk. And today, extreme weather events contribute only 0.06% to global and U.S. mortality. So that's quite significant. So finally, mortality from extreme weather events has declined even as all coros mortality has increased, indicating that humanity is coping better with extreme weather events than it is with far more important health and safety problems. That's quite an interesting observation. <coughs> And how about those drowning islands? I just want to make a point here. Um, when uh, Minister McKenna returned from COP21 uh, with uh, a little palm frond on her jacket, and she was saying that they had to go for a, a um, more extreme target, the 1.5 degrees Celsius, target for uh, uh, GHG reductions and uh, she said that it, it's because the people from the Marshall Islands were very concerned about the fact that sea level rise would inundate their tiny islands and uh, so that was her rationale for signing on to the very expensive economically catastrophic Paris Agreement. Um, these same targets are the things that have driven the energy crisis that's now about to sink most of Europe and cause tremendous suffering, poverty, and probably death this winter due to the energy crisis. And yet we find out that these islands actually are not sinking. Or you'll see once I read this material to you that they're actually doing fine and many are growing. So you've been misled by the media. <clears throat> so Micronesian islands are growing. There's a 3% net increase of land area across the archipelago since the mid 20th century. And this is an excerpt of the report. Shoreline changes in coral reef islands of the Federated States of Micronesia since the mid 20th century. It says that uh, 104 coral reef islands from 16 atolls in the Western Equatorial Pacific nation of the Federated States of Micronesia across a period coincident with rising local sea level and high frequency of storm events. So that's what they analyzed. They used aerial photographs from the mid-40s and 1970s, analyzed them alongside high-resolution satellite images, and the results were revealing an accretion, that means growth, that has been the predominant model of shoreline change, with 46% of the studied shorelines showing statistically significant accretion, growth, leading to a net increase of 6437 hectares or a 3% increase of plan form land area across the archipelago. And these results provide empirical evidence of shoreline accretion or growth despite local sea level rise. 
And here we have Ontario, Antonio Guterres sinking under the seas, the rising sea levels, and yet we have global scale changes in the area of atoll islands during the 21st century. 221 atolls in the Indian Pacific Oceans grew with total land area increasing by 62 kilometers, square kilometers, or 6.1 percent. Wow. So again, an excerpt from that study. Global scale changes in the area of atoll islands during the 21st century. The long-term persistence of atoll islands is under threat due to continued sea level rise driven by anthropogenic climate change. They take that as a given. One widely discussed potential impact of sea level rise is the widespread chronic erosion of atoll islands. Despite concerns of erosion driven by sea level rise, no published evidence exists of pervasive erosion of atoll islands at global scale. So they used Landsat imagery and they studied the changes of land area on 221 atolls, showing that between 2000 and 2017, the total land area on these atolls increased by 61.74 square kilometers, 6.1%, from 1,007.60 square kilometers to 1,069.35 square kilometers. Most of the change in land area resulted from island building within the Maldives and on atolls in the South China Sea. And since 2000, the Maldives have added 35 point, uh, 37.50 square kilometers of land area, while 16.57 square kilometers of new islands have appeared within the South China Seas, Spratly and Paracel chains. So that's fairly impressive and contrary to what we hear in the media. And again, atolls growing or stable despite sea level rise. Here's another one. A global assessment of atoll island planform changes over the past decades. And here's the summary. Over the past decades, atoll islands distribute, exhibited no widespread sign of physical destabilization in the face of sea level rise. A reanalysis of available data which cover 30 Pacific and Indian Ocean atolls, including 709 islands, reveals that no atoll lost land area and that 88.6% of islands were either stable or increased in area, while only 11.4% contracted. Well, that's good news, isn't it? So contrary to climate catastrophe headlines, the islands are mostly increasing in size, contrary to the alarmist narrative that entire nations could be wiped off the face of Earth by rising sea levels. And now let's look at river deltas. So despite sea level rise, deltas globally have experienced a net land gain of 54 square kilometers per year or about 1,600 square kilometers over the period. And here's the study that reports on that. And how about beaches? Well, beaches are better too. Since 1984, the world's sandy and gravel beaches had a total area gain of 3,663 square kilometers. Let's have a look at um, this at a closer look at this. So um, you can see here that the yellow is sand and the dark brown is not sand, non-sand. Global distribution of sandy shorelines. The colored dots along the world's shoreline represent the local percentage of sandy shorelines. Yellow is sand, dark brown, non-sand. The subplot to the right presents the relative occurrence of sandy shorelines per degree of latitude, where the dashed line shows the latitudinal distribution of sandy shorelines reported by Hayes. The lower subplot presents the relative occurrence of sandy shorelines per degree of longitude. 
the curved dash gray lines in the main plot represent the boundaries of the ice-free shorelines considered in our analysis. The underlined percentages indicate the percentages of sandy shorelines averaged per continent and then they describe how they made the map and the plotting. So again, that's good news. And here's some of the best news. CO2 fertilization effect explaining 70% of the observed greening trend. So this is about the greening of the earth and its drivers. And so people often say, well, CO2, you know, warming planet, we're all going to die. And yet we find in this report, here we use three long-term satellite leaf area index, which is abbreviated as LAI, so the leaf area index records, and 10 global ecosystem models to investigate four key drivers of leaf area index trends from 1982 to 2009. We show a persistent and widespread increase of growing season integrated LAI, leaf area index, or greening, of over 25 to 50 percent of the global vegetated area, whereas less than 4 percent of the globe shows decreasing leaf area index, or brownings. So CO2 fertilization effects explain most of the greening trends in the tropics, whereas climate change resulted in greening of the high latitudes and the Tibetan plateau, um, uh, land cover change contributed most to the regional greening, and then it goes on to explain where that happened. Well, well, well. And guess what? Carbon fixation by photosynthesis has risen by about 31% since 1900, equivalent to 47% for a doubling of carbon dioxide. So um, this is uh, titled Higher Than Expected CO2 Fertilization Inferred from Leaf to Global Observations. And several lines of evidence point to an increase in the activity of terrestrial biosphere over recent decades, impacting the global net land carbon sink. That means that it retains it, it sequesters it, and its control on the growth of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Global terrestrial gross primary production, the rate of carbon fixation by photosynthesis, is estimated to have risen by 3 to 5, uh, uh, by 31% plus or minus, um, that's the margin of error, since 1900. But the uh, relative contributions of different putative drivers to this increase are not well known. So here we identify the rising atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations as the dominant driver. So that's pretty significant that actually carbon dioxide is greening the Earth. And so they say here, our historic value is nearly twice as high as current estimates of 17%, plus or minus 4%, that do not use the full range of available constraints. And they also say these findings suggest a larger beneficial role of the land carbon sink in modulating future excess anthropogenic carbon dioxide. And here's another study. Elevated carbon dioxide is making arid regions greener. So it's actually greening the desert, shall we say. And this study says a study of arid regions using satellite imagery data finds that the carbon dioxide fertilization effect has caused an 11% increase in foliage after adjusting the data for precipitation and other factors during 1982 to 2010 when CO2 concentrations increased by 14%. So that's um, good news. But we never see it in the headlines, do we? So these are good news headlines. And these confirm that there's no climate emergency, as Clintel says. And if facts matter to journalists, 
well, why aren't they telling you this? So there's no climate emergency. The climate emergency is in fact over and we do have time. And when I say that the climate emergency is over, what I'm referring to is the fact that the uh, idea of a climate emergency basically arose from the misuse of what's known as RCP 8.5, which is again a computer modeled scenario which was actually meant just for research purposes. It was not meant for policy making. But a lot of um, activists got hold of this and it propagated itself throughout the scientific community as well. And a lot of the research that comes up with a catastrophic conclusion uses the RCP 8.5. And I'll just, I'll just show you here. I have kind of a large version of it. So you can see that this is what it looks like. And here is RCP 8.5. Um, so this is deemed to be an implausible scenario. That's why it was only meant for use as a research tool. It was not meant for use as a policy tool. These are not intended to be seen as optional pathways for how we should conduct our business on Earth. They're not meant to be seen as how many people we should have on Earth. And this is kind of critical because there's a lot of depopulationists in the climate zealot community. And this graph might give people the wrong impression because there are three billion less people in these scenarios than this one. But this is an implausible scenario. The, it, these are also based on outdated science in that these were set up way back in 2011. And since that time, we've instituted all kinds of climate policies and all kinds of environmental policies. And um, these have also changed how our emissions are going into the air, for instance, in the OECD countries, our emissions have pretty much flatlined for probably a decade, whereas the greatest increase in emissions is in um, the developing nations, especially China and India. And uh, so we have to be a bit more commonsensical and realize that this is where the idea of a climate emergency came from. But if we take that away, then there's no climate emergency, is there? And we do have time. So that's a really important takeaway. And Roger PLK Jr. and Justin Ritchie have done a lot of research work on this very topic of the misuse of RCP 8.5. So I suggest that people look up their work and have a closer look at what they had to say. Of course, what I'm presenting to you is in layman's language um, it's just trying to give you a sense of why there was a climate emergency in some people's mind and why there isn't one now and why we do have time. So uh, have a look at that material, have a look at the Clintel World Climate Declaration and let me also invite you to please come to our website and have a look at that. We've got lots of insights there, we've got lots of YouTube videos, or we do sort of plain language explainers. And uh, we've also got lots of very scientific material for those who prefer that. And we're quite active on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So we invite you to engage with us and let's have a climate conversation. I hope this was helpful and uh, offered you some insights. And I thank the commentators on YouTube for having requested uh, that we have um, a longer version, a more slow read, so that people have a chance to absorb the information and have a bit more of a critical look at it. Again, I will be posting this on our blog as a PowerPoint so that you can go in and click on all the links and go and read the entire material yourself. So for Friends of Science Society, thanks very much for watching. Please put your comments down below and we'll try and respond to them as we can.